All right. Welcome, everyone, to uh, to the meetup here. We're going to get started. It is uh, well after 9 o'clock on the west coast of Canada here. Um, I'm super happy to have my good friend Jan Carl here. He's going to be talking about an introduction to VBA class modules. Uh, but before we get into that part here, I'm just going to run through and do our, our quick, normal, uh, standard intro here. So um, obviously, we're into the welcome and overview here, and I'll just uh, run through the sponsor slides. So uh, first off, every one of these meetups is sponsored by SkillWave, which is our training platform uh, that I run with myself and Matt Ellington, where we actually go and teach people how to use Power Query and Power Pivot and Power BI and all good things around Excel and Power BI for building business intelligence. And uh, if you haven't checked out our courses, you definitely should. ExoGuru is the parent company of SkillWave and also the developer and uh, distributor of my monkey tools add-in, which lets you build better data models faster. Um, our next meetup's coming up here. Uh, so we have one more meetup coming up in 2023. We've got um, Alex Kolokolov is going to be coming back to join us again at 10 a.m. Pacific time. He's going to be doing the Dashboard Cemetery Walk. And this is a presentation that we had scheduled earlier in the year, but uh, didn't quite work. So I'm um, looking forward to, uh, to seeing that one. And then um, coming in January, <laughs> that's when I'm going to give John lots of time to talk. And I promise not to cut him off. Uh, well, actually, probably shouldn't promise that. But um, John will be coming back to talk about about enhancing our Excel charting experience. And this is gonna be cool because we're gonna see some of John's charting tools in work here. Um, this is gonna be the first of a series of presentations we're doing on Excel add-ins, which is gonna be awesome. Uh, just to, speaking of Excel add-ins, to give you a quick note here, um, yesterday, two days ago, I published, what is today, the 16th? Yeah, two days ago, I published a new build of Monkey Tools. Uh, we now have BiblioMonkey tagging available to all users on a free license, as well as a more expanded menu for data model tagging options. If you're not familiar with what this does, this allows you to actually store measures, and when you inject them into your workbook or queries or formulas, when you inject them into your workbook, it will prop, pop up and prompt you with context-sensitive prompts to actually build your formulas, measures, queries, and things like that. We've added a bunch more data model tagging options to allow more granular tagging and provide a shorter list when you're actually inserting these things into your workbook. In addition, we have also expanded the Excel context menu. So when you right click on your cell, you can actually inject things for pro users, can now inject queries and measures directly into the workbook with no need to open BiblioMonkey at all. And as is only natural, we've also released a ton of bug fixes in the releases over the last couple of weeks. So if you haven't checked out Monkey Tools, you absolutely should. My Excel Fundamentals Bootcamp last kickoff date for 2023 is coming on December 13th. If you're looking to uh, to up your game and fill in some knowledge gaps around working with formulas and pivot tables and Power Query and data visualization, you should check this out at SkillWave. The link is on the slide. And all of these slides, of course, have already been uploaded to the Meetup site. This program is ideal for people learning to uh, wanting to learn pivot tables and increase, increase their formula reporting skills and master Power Query. One of the big bonuses of this course is that it comes with access to my Ask Ken sessions, where we do two two-hour sessions um, per month where you can ask any question you want, and I will go through and answer it. Likewise, my self-service BI Bootcamp, this is sort of our flagship product uh, for me here, um, where we actually deal with Power Query, Power Pivot, Power BI, um, all kinds of good things in this as, as well. Um, this is a really comprehensive program, includes access to the Ask Ken sessions and whatnot as well as a subscription to Monkey Tools Pro. Um, this last kickoff for this year, again, is December 13th. If you're interested, you should definitely check this one out. Uh, I guarantee that this will help you up your Power Pivot and Power Query reporting game, as well as get you into Power BI if you haven't started using that platform. This meetup, as are all meetups, will be uh, recorded. Um, the recording is active now and uh, will be posted to our SkillWave YouTube channel. Um, give me a couple of days to get everything produced and uploaded, but it will be available to you before the end of the weekend. So um, just be aware that that will be coming. Uh, also, I just want to quick uh, feature a quick little note on our monkey shorts video. Um, there's uh, one we're featuring here, how to unfill in Power Query. This is a three minutes or less is what monkey shorts are of technical content. So if you're looking for bite-sized learning, these things are completely free, and there's a whole bunch of them available on our SkillWave YouTube channel. Last thing I want to say is if you are interested in coming and speaking at our meetup, we would love to have you. Please fill out the speaker form here, and we will get in touch and get you onto our platform. And at that point... I'm fading to black, young Carl. I think at this point in time, we can turn it over to you, my friend, and we can talk a little bit about VBA. I'm looking forward to this. This is going to be great. 
Yeah, VBA, the old stuff, right? Absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, but old stuff, but still so useful, right? Like, I mean, it's the stuff that the dinosaurs use, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, but uh, I guess I'm a dinosaur uh, yeah. then. It is still the go-to development platform if you want to quickly develop something in, in Excel, you know, automate Absolutely. something really quickly. And it has tools that none of the others has. So yeah, it's still my go-to. Um, let's see, let me first share my entire screen. I'm on this 38 inch monitor here. So I'm not going to um, pester you guys all with sharing this entire screen, but I just wanted to quickly show you my setup, which is on the left here is my, um, you know, the, 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 the stuff that I glance at, my speaker notes. And here on the right, that is what I'm going to share with you. So you see my, if you see my mouse going to the left and right all the time, you know why I'm doing that because I'm clicking on both ends. So that's you know, just, that's my just friend, that. I, I got to tell you, this makes me feel like an imposter because I use PowerPoint for my slide decks and here you are as the true Excel master using Excel for everything. PowerPoint, what's that? Yeah, it's, it's, that, <laughs> it's that Excel add-in that we have that is supposed mm. to be for presentations, but there you go. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I I thought I'd keep it all in Excel because that makes it less confusing for me because I don't have to, you know, switch to and fro all the time. Um, so yeah, there's that. <clears throat> and so what I'm using here in Excel is a mixture of, you know, uh, the hyperlink function and uh, all sorts of hidden text here so that I can just click on my subjects here and get taken to the area where that information is rather than just hitting the arrow key and PowerPoint doing the rest of the work, right? Fair enough, yeah. Okay, so class modules. So this presentation is more or less aimed at the people who've been dabbling in VBA, writing loads of code maybe even, but never had the real courage to actually implement the class module in their code. They may have added one or two which they you know downloaded from the internet and then implemented not really knowing what they're up to um, but it is a, a completely different business if you have to start creating your own class modules so i'm looking at you um, excel vba developers who've never had an education programming wise um, i'm one of them uh, so let's get started with that um, Class modules allow you to do object-oriented programming. There you go, some terms that we need to learn. What the heck is object-oriented programming? Well, it is what you do if you program against the VBA, uh, X, sorry, it's what you're doing when you're programming Excel VBA because you're working with the objects inside Excel. Class modules allow you to create your own module, uh, your own objects, that, that's the basis of it. So remember, you have been using objects all the time already. There's nothing new to using a class module. It works exactly the same as programming against, for example, the range object in Excel or the worksheets collection in Excel. A worksheet is also a class. A range is a class, anything is a class. Well, it's an object, but behind the scenes, there's a class below it, with, which contains the code that's actually running the class. So that is nothing else there. Um, if you read the books, then there's always a couple of character, sorry, they always share a couple of characteristics of object-oriented programming. And the terms they use is encapsulation, polymorphism, or however you pronounce that, and inheritance. So encapsulation simply means that all of the data that a class needs is will belong to the class and can only be modified by the class and inside the class. Um, it means that the class will validate any input and output data and should raise errors if data is invalid. Um, it also means that if you change the way that the class processes your data, it will not impact other code in your project. And I'll get to that later. Um, it also means that everything that the class needs to function is coded inside the class module. 
So in theory, the class does not call any generic functions in other modules of your project. There is one exception though, a class may use or implement other classes. So if you might have, uh, I know, an error handling class, that class might be used in all of the other classes in your project. So that is what encapsulation kind of seems to mean. Um, another thing that they say about classes is that they have polymorphism. Uh, what that basically means is that classes look alike. And I think the, the, the explanation that was given in the, in the very old VB6 book by Francesco Bellina um, is quite clear. And I'll, I invite you to read this at leisure later on. Um, by the way, Ken's going to share my file with you, so you don't have to take notes about this. Um, and finally, um, there's a thing called inheritance, but we can forget about that because VBA doesn't really support inheritance. Um, it is the idea that you can create one big class that lies at the bottom of all of your other classes, and then you can actually refer to that class to get a couple of things like um, uh, properties and methods that are already used in the base class. So you're actually deriving one class from another. Well, VBA doesn't support that, so we can forget about that. So that is about characteristics of object orienting programming. Um, and let's move on to understanding classes. So a class module is nothing more than just a special type of VBA module. It's just insert module. It's the way you, uh, you are probably used to working. You may have inserted a user form or two. Well, you can also insert a class module and it, that's all there is to it really. Um, inside a class module, you can actually create new objects and you can write your own properties, you can write your own methods, and you can even define your own events. And a class module is the written code. You define the properties, the methods, the events in your class module. Once you are starting to use the class modules in your code, that is when you're actually creating objects from that class. So an object is actually a copy of the class created at runtime. So an object requires memory and it might require other system resources um, and it is destroyed when you no longer need it. So to separate these two, think of it like this. Classes are the things that you write. They are design time only entities. Objects are things that you run. So they are runtime only entities. So programmers see classes, users experience objects. So there are some advantages to using classes. Um, not going to regurgitate all of this, but um, if you write them properly, you have a clearly defined interface. Um, it's easier to talk to properties and methods than to keep score of array indexes and all of that stuff. Um, if you use classes properly, it makes it easier to follow the overall program sequence. Uh, and classes allow you to generate dozens of equally shaped objects that are independently from one, one another by design. You don't have to start creating arrays to put things together. You can all have that managed by the class. And if you write them properly, classes are easy to reuse in other VBA projects. Um, another advantage I see is that if you encounter an error in a class module, um, it's usually pretty easy to solve the error in the class module without affecting any code that is actually using the class. And finally, classes, as I mentioned before, allow you to create event procedures. So I found one or two disadvantages of classes as well. And the first one being they are harder to understand for the beginner programming. Um, they are more work to test if you as you have to write supporting code to instantiate the class. And of course, generating that class from the class module takes a little bit of time. So if you do um, class modules extensively, your code might be slightly 
tiny little bit be slower than when you're writing um, straightforward function subroutine type of code. But the benefits are outweigh the, the disadvantages in my opinion. So let's see where I am. I've discussed class advantages, disadvantages. I've told a bit about oriented programming and characteristics. So I think we're ready to do something about properties and methods. Let me go back to my table of content. And here's the fun. If you've ever done a presentation in Excel, um, you can use the hyperlink function to jump into that VBA editor directly. Let me demonstrate that to you. There we are. A single click takes me into the VBA editor right into that subroutine that I pointed it to. So let's, cre let's create our first class module. Enough talking. So insert class module. And I promise to name that class module. Let me go into my speaker notes here before I do anything silly. CLS properties. So there's here this new class called class one. And of course we need to name that class. I'm going to use the silly name called CLS properties. And let's create one public variable, public, uh, any text. As a string. This is all it takes to create one class module with one property because any variable that you declare at the top automatically becomes a public a property of the class. On proof, let me go back to that module here and I'll just dim CS CLS properties. C equals new CLS properties. And as soon as I type the period, we'll see only just one property called any text. And I can set it equal to anything. That is all there is to it. Now you've probably heard about property let set and get procedures and everything. That's not that difficult either. So here we have a public de publicly declared variable and it's already a property. Uh, the problem with this is that um, there is absolutely no control in your code over what other code is going to assign to this property. So other code might be trying to assign an object to this text variable, which can cause all kinds of trouble as you know. So let's convert this public property variable into a private one. And let's just, I don't know, I'll just make up the variable name for now. So we now need the property let and get procedures for these. And I'm going to copy them from my other project because I'm a sucker for typing. Okay, I see I, have, I had a different variable name in mind, so let me copy that and put it here. So it is this set of two property get and let statements that shape one property. And the beauty of this is that this is the property let procedure. So let this is the proper this is the procedure that gets called if you try to assign a value to your class property. That means that in this section here you can do everything that's needed to make sure that the data that gets passed into your property is legal. Similarly, in the property get statement and that is the one that runs as soon as you try to retrieve information from your class. You can put code here that makes sure that what gets passed out is exactly what is expected from the class and nothing else. So an error handler in this position would raise errors if anything is wrong. And to demonstrate that this actually works, let's just step through this code and I'll just do a message box 
C dot anything, any text, sorry about that. And I'll just step through the code. So we're instantiated, we're instantiating a new instance of the class by this statement, set C equals new copy of CLS properties. And I'm going to put anything into the property called any text. And if I F8 now, you'll see that we get jumped into the CLS property class module into the property let statement. And if you hover your mouse over here, you'll see the value that's been passed in. And of course the local any text local variable for the class is still empty. And if I F8 once now, it's going to be filled with that value anything. Similarly, if I now try to call the value of any text from the class, I'll, I'll be jumped into the property get procedure, and it's going to return the value of that uh, module level variable that I defined containing anything, and it's going to show that in a message box. So this is a really rudimentary example of how properties in a class work. Now, suppose you want to add a method to the class. Um, that is as simple as adding a public subroutine. And that is going to make any text equals nothing. Oh, I forgot to type sub. Beginner mistake, of course. So adding a method to your class is simple as well. So does this work? Let's try. So let's go back to the other one and add here C dot and C. Here we have our new clear contents method. And if I message box again, you should see an empty message box. Let's get rid of this one. So run through this, F5. See, we have an empty message box. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, um, and I'm going to ask you, Ken, to keep tabs on that. If there are any questions, please dump them into the chat, and, and Ken will just interrupt me and give me opportunity to answer them. Can you do that, Ken? I can absolutely do that. Thank you. If there's any already, um, Inter you can, well, it's time to interrupt me now. So, so far, you're good. No questions at this point. So uh, keep on yeah, going. They're, they're going to flood in right after, I, you know. <laughs> there you go. Right. So, yeah, that is exactly how you create a class module. You simply insert the class and any of the properties you need. Well, if you're just beginning with them, just declare them as public at the top here. This is all it takes. And it can be any object type, of course. And you have to assign them in the same way. You know, if they're objects, you have to use set rather than just equals. Um, which means that if you are have if you have an object property, you're not using property let, but you're just simply changing this L to an S. And then you have a property set procedure. So that means that this needs to be an object. Okay, good. Properties and methods. So I when I was creating this presentation, I was kind of hesitating in the proper order of everything. Um, and I realize now that talking about class instances earlier might have been a good idea, but I didn't, so I'm going to do that right now. Yeah, and Carl, I'm going to interrupt you with a question right now. Good. Um, so, uh, so we got a question. Properties are like variables, and objects are like subs, all inside a class module. Then, I would phrase it differently. So, so properties, yes, properties are like variables. It's just that because they're in a class, and because you can use these property let and get procedures, um, it means that a class allows you to give finer control over what happens with your information that you're passing to the cloud class and the information that you're getting back from the class. 
So it allows finer control over the data. Um, function and routines are what make um, class methods. So a subroutine inside a class, a public sub, is by default a method of the class. So cool. Yeah, hope that answers the question. If not, speak up. I would say, unmute and just tell me. Um, a couple of words about class instances because I think that's really important to understand. A class module is just text. It is not running code. Even if it may look like so, if you're debugging because you get jumped into that class module and it is showing you the class module content, a class module is nothing more than just text. It is not running code. It becomes running code when you instantiate the class. And here I have a picture of three instances of the same class. So instance one has x equals 20, instance two has x equals 30, and instance three has x equals minus 13. And these three independent copies of each other all contain their own variables, and they manage their own variables as well. And I'll show that in a minute. So as I said, each instance is completely independent from the other. It has its own contents and it calls its own methods and properties. So let's try and demonstrate that. So I have here a class module that's called CLS some class. So I'm not really good at naming stuff as you can imagine. Um, and this is what I showed in the Excel front end already. It contains one property called X, which expects a long, and it contains one method that's called demo. And all demo does is it shows a message box with the content of X. Um, here we have three declared variables to hold three instances of that class. So let's run through this code step by step. So I'm instantiating that class once here, the second time here, and a third time here. So if we look at the locals window, we see we have three instances of some class in these variables here. And you also see that we have the properties here automatically. So if I F8 now, you should see C some class, some class one, the X become 20 and etc. And then if I run the demo method of some class one, it's going to go to show us the value of this X here. So I F8, it jumps into the demo sub, but it's going to dump in the version that has X equals 20. It's going to show us 20. Uh, we can also change the value of the class. So we have some class two that currently contains 30 and we're going to add three. So some class two now should contain 33, as you can see. And I can show that by calling the demo method of some class two. So class instances is relatively straightforward once you get the hang of it. Yeah, and Carl, can I interrupt you with another question? Sure. So based on, on what you're showing right now, as you step through this thing, um, you're obviously able to assign values to your variables that are inside your class without declaring a let or get statement. Yes. Why would you declare the let or get statement? What is the advantage of doing that versus just this? Or does this only work for simple assignment or and, and retrieval? What, what's the advantage of declaring those specific let and get statements rather than just assigning things and retrieving them this way? Well, it it, it makes it easier to do defensive programming, for example. Um, it makes it easier to put code in that property let statement that's going to check whether the values that you're passing to the class are legal for the class. Um, suppose you have, I don't know, 
it's like a validation rule in Excel, right? I mean, if you have a cell and you're expecting a numeric entry between one and a hundred, you can guard your class against people trying to enter minus one or plus 10,000 and let the class raise an error if that happens. And okay, it's not means, necessarily yeah. just against um, user mistakes, but it might also be against, you know, logic problems in your code that for some reason cause invalid entries to be passed into your class. Fair enough. That makes sense. For, for reference, I don't know personally that I've ever actually seen a class property used without the let or get statement. I was actually surprised to see this, and that's why I asked. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I deliberately showed that because it, probably makes it easier for the people who are used to just using subroutines and declaring variables at the top of modules to make them module um, aware um, that you can also do that in a class and you know get started really really quickly fair enough yeah um, thanks yeah and, and one tip i wanted to share which i didn't put in the presentation but if you're writing a class and if you're having issues with this, the syntax of these property let and get statements um, I can really recommend to install a, a tool like um, MZ Tools. Um, I don't think I have it on this machine, but if if you have a public, public, um, as uh, I don't know, string, MZ Tools allows you to right-click the variable name and then um, select um, convert into property let get procedure, and it will do all the heavy lifting for you. So, you know, it will convert this into a private variable. It will add the property let and get statements with all of the mumbo jumbo that belongs to it. In fact, I use it so heavily that I forget how to manually type property get and let statement because I never do it. Okay, let's see where we're at. I'm going to close that locals window. So yeah, an important thing to realize when you're using classes is that they behave exactly the same as when you're using variables inside a routine. So as soon as you, you reach that end sub statement, you lose all of your classes that you define inside the routine. Um, one way to hold class, sorry, I'm losing track. Okay, so I showed you one way to have instances of classes. So this one's hard coded to only have three instances. Um, of course, in most of your code, you won't know upfront how many instances of class you will have. So in this case, what I always use is I use a collection to hold all of the pointers to the classes. And I made this, this code um, versatile on purpose. So uh, it allows me to add as many um, instances of the class that I like. So let me put a breaker here. I'm going to F5 this. So how many instances do we like? Let's just do four because otherwise I'm going to click F8 forever. Um, we have four instances, yay. Let's actually prove that. So let's open that locals pane again. And we have that instances collection over here. And if we unfold that, you can see we have four items, so that's that's good. And as you can see, each item only displays the properties. It doesn't display anything about uh, which type of class we're looking at. That's up to you to um, know from your code. But it does list you all of the properties. So X1, X4, X9. What am I doing here? I'm probably doing, oh yeah, I'm, I'm just, you know, using quadratics, quadrat quadratics here. So, and then you can just loop through the instances. And etc. And rather than using a counted loop, you, of course, you can also declare a variable that is called some class which has the same type as the one that you have assigned to the collection, and you can use the for each construction here. So to prove that, let me just go here. So this is the first one, it's going to show one, and then the second one is going to show four, and the third one is going to show nine, of course. 
and then the last one's going to show 16. Good. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is that class modules contain events by default. So let me go back into that sum class event. Um, sorry, go back into the sum class module and look at the drop downs here. There's a drop down called class and it automatically inserts the class initialize event. Um, it's not the one I'm interested in, uh, interested in at the moment. Interested in terminate. So this automatically runs as soon as your class goes out of scope. A class goes out of scope if no variable is pointing to the class. So for example, in this example, we have this instances collection. And as soon as we, let me get rid of all these message boxes. As soon as we set instances to nothing, it's going to destroy all our four classes or however many we decided to have. And it's going to call its class terminate event one by one. So let me demonstrate that. So I'll F5, I'll just give it three classes. I'm sorry, three instances. I'm going to click OK. And now we're here. So let's open that immediate pane again, I mean locals pane. And as you can see, we have three instances. But note here, we also have a sum class variable here. So we might need to destruct some class as well. Bear in mind, just keep in mind that it's there. I'm now just going to set that collection to nothing. And what then happens is it's going to um, destroy all of the class instances that are in the collection automatically. So F8 takes me. Why? Oh, okay. This is the VBA editor biting me. Sometimes, for some reason, it goes full speed without continuing to debug. So let me just press Control Break. Now oh, it doesn't break in class modules. So there's my demo for you. Um, let me go to the class and put a break here. Sorry. Rewind. Running this demo. It contains. The heck is going on? Good. I want three instances. Click OK. I have three instances here, and I then have a an object variable, an object variable called some class because I use that. Um, oh, in this loop. So I'm now going to clear the collection. Hmm. So this is where I didn't actually practice this part of the presentation. And I'm really, really surprised that it's not doing what I was expecting it to do. Try again. Where are we? Wow, this is aggravating. Stop. Let me just do two. So this is what I intended to happen. So we're now closing the first of the two that I instantiated. It's going to give me that message box closing one. And automatically it's going to do it for the second instance, closing four, which is two times two. And now we're at the end of the routine. And notice how, let me rerun this. I'm, I want two again. 
Notice how if we look at the locals window, we have a collection of two instances which contain x1 and x4, and then we have a variable called some class, which I set to nothing. Um, whereas you might expect that some class, that setting some class to nothing would have destroyed the last one in the collection because that's the last one of this for next loop. The point is that a class stays alive for as long as any variable is pointing to it. And here we have the situation where we have both some class pointing to the class and the instances collection pointing to the instances of the class. So that's why I first destroyed the some class variable, ensuring that um, only the instances collection is pointing to all of my class instances. Clear as mud? It's probably going to get confusing really quickly if I continue like this. <laughs> So yeah, there you go. Th this is about instances. So if you've destroyed all of your instances, then automatically all of your classes are destroyed. That doesn't make any sense at all. And I th and as you can see, my um, VBA editor is doing something really weird because it's showing that it's in break mode here, but it's actually not showing me where it's in break mode mode at all. None of the subroutines appear to be in break mode. So there's clearly a bug here. And uh, this is Office Insider, maybe that's why. Okay, let me have a look where I need to go next. Event classes, that's where I need to go next. Let me do that both on the part that you're not seeing and on the end that I am seeing. To get rid of all the breakpoints. Sorry, debug, clear all breakpoints. Is that VBA editor? Back to home, event classes. So one thing that I see a lot of people struggle with, and I think this was actually the reason why we started this presentation to begin with, is how would you create a class module that allows you to handle application level of Excel events? So events like the opening of a workbook or the saving of a workbook or even selecting a different sheet on any workbook that you have open. And there's actually five things that you need to get that working. The first of them is a class module, of course. And we'll call that class module CLS app events. The second one being an instance of that class module. So we need an object variable Sorry, uh, I was looking cross-eyed. The second thing we need is inside that class module, you need an object variable declared using the keyword with events. That is the object for which you want to trigger events. And in this case, in this example, we are going to respond to application level Excel, Excel application level events. Then of course we need to instantiate the class because a class, remember, a class is just a blueprint. If you don't do anything, nothing's going to run. So we're going to initialize that application event handler by this simple statement. Then step four is we need to make sure that that instance stays in memory for as long as we want those events handled. And step five is that we need to actually assign an object to that Excel app variable that we have here. Otherwise, nothing is going to happen. So let's have a look at the code. So we need these steps. Um, I told you we need to insert a class module. I see, insert class module, I just did. I'm going to call that class module CLS app events and now declare that variable public with events and this is key if you omit that nothing's going to happen this is yeah. just a variable name yeah and yes. carl 
Before you yeah. uh, run too deep, your uh, your CLS class, class events and your uh, public there both came in as, as X's, so you've got an XLS app events, just so you know. Yeah. Uh, is this better? Uh, it, it doesn't matter to me. I just want you to know when you're wondering why the heck your code's not working. But there's a so your your actual name of your of your class itself is XLS app events, not CLS app events. Oh well, yeah, thank if you. that if that screws you up. So because I know that VBA can be particularly um, pedantic when it comes to spelling. So thanks a lot for that, Ken. <laughs> no worries. So here, yeah. So so this is just a variable name. Don't be scared. It's just a variable name. Nothing else. If you're Control Z. So finally, you need to say what the type is of that variable because if you if you don't, it's not going to respond to any event. It needs to be a specific object type. And because we are programming in VBA, um, the IntelliSense knows which objects can um, fire events. So it's only going to list you objects that can fire events. And it might make sense to have a look at these because it can be an interesting list to use. So let's just do application. So now that we have public with events Excel app as application, we can now start using the events belonging to the Excel application. So which are those? Well, this this works exactly the same as like you are in a, this workbook or in one of the sheet modules. So you go to the top and you'll see anything that you've declared with using with events, it's going to appear here. So Excel app, and automatically it already inserts the default event, which appears to be new workbook. So let's just go with that. And as you can see, it automatically passes you the pointer to the new workbook that's been insert inserted. And it helps to have a look at what um, events you have available to you. And this looks very familiar to what's already available in the this workbook event um, module, but it is one high one level higher up. So if you select any of these, you'll see that it contains an additional variable in the event. For example, the sheet change event will give you. Oh, it doesn't. Okay, forget that I said that. Um, but hey, you know, th these are available to you now. So you might think that if I add a new workbook to Excel now, so if I just hit Control N here, it might fire that event, but it doesn't. Why doesn't it? Well, because we haven't instantiated that class yet, right? So let's go back. Let's go back to the regular module here and let's initiate that event handler. So I've declared a variable here, instantiated here, and then finally I assign the Excel application to the variable that's going to handle those events. So you would think that it now it now would respond to a control N adding a new worksheet, a workbook, but it doesn't. Why doesn't it do that? Any takers? I'll show you why. Um, let's add a proper. Let's go to back to, into our class and add the class terminate event. So let me rerun this routine step by step this time. Oh, um, I'm bumped into the class terminate event and it tells me, hey, I'm gone. Why is that? Well, simple, because we declared that app event handler variable inside the subroutine. This needs to go at the top. It needs to go here. And let me capitalize this to indicate to myself this is a module level variable. Let's now try this again. And let's try inserting a workbook. 
You saw that? Let's go back into the VBA and see. My newly created application level event just fired. And it tells me that a new workbook was inserted. So there, let's, let's go back. Let's go back to the front of this where I had the explanation. To have code that responds to application level events, you need these five steps. Don't forget any of them because it will not work without them. So first of all, of course, you need that class module. Then inside that class module, you, you need that statement containing that with events keyword. keyword. Then of course, inside your class module, that's actually a, you know, a step 2A to be honest. You of course need to declare which event you want to use. I forgot that in, in my text. Then in any regular module or even in another class, you need to create a new instance of that class. Then step four, you need to make sure that that class does not go out of scope. So there needs to be a variable, preferably declared at the module level, that's going to hold that pointer to the class. And that way it's going to keep that instance of the class alive during your programming, your Excel session. And finally, and importantly, a step that most people don't seem to grasp, you need to assign that variable that you declared as with event, needs to get assigned the object that it needs to respond to. So in the app, in the CLS app events class, here's our declaration. Um, I used the top level drop downs to create the event. I went into a normal module and I have a declaration that's going to hold the instance of the class. I'm setting a new instance of the class here, assigning it to that module level variable. And then I'm telling the class instance that that Excel app needs to respond to the Excel application object. And if you have all these steps in place, that's when your event handler starts working. Now, because we declared <clears throat> because we declared a routine level application event handler, our class is still working. So if I close VBA editor and insert a new workbook, uh, I probably pressed stop somewhere. Oh no, I because I uncommented these, my everything went out of scope. Let me F5 this again. It's going to work now if I insert a new workbook. There you go, new workbook inserted. And the only way to make this stop, see, new workbook inserted. The only way to make this stop is either by hitting the stop button or by just resetting that event handler. And look, this is going to push us into that class terminate event again. And this is where you do clean up, like um, for example, set Excel app equals nothing. It's always good practice to do stuff like this, even though it's not entirely necessary. So this makes it all go away. Okay, so that is how you create an application level event handler. Um, Ken, how am I on time? You're good. You can take as much as you need. Okay. Well, that sounds like a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be here for another couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm close to wrapping up. I just wanted to show you one last pretty useful example. At least I think so. It's, it's an example about object classes and, um, I mentioned object classes, and that is because they handle objects. And this particular example is an example where I'm using two class modules, one called CLS Sheet, and the other one called CLS Workbook, to handle unprotecting worksheets in a workbook and the workbook itself. So in my workbook here, I have one worksheet that is protected, that's this one. Um, 
it only allows me to edit these cells. So everything else is protected. If I try to type something here, it's giving you the message, right? And I'm going to use a simple class module, the CLS sheet class module here. And this I'm going to use to remove protection from the worksheet. Um, and then let other code do the processing and then have the class terminate event take care of automatically protecting my worksheet again. So what have we here? We have a public property called worksheet abbreviated because I don't want to um, duplicate the same name as object names. Um, once I once this gets called, I'm assigning that to a variable called WS pointer because it couldn't come up with a better name. And then I have a method called unprotect, which does exactly what it says. And finally, in the class terminate, it checks whether the class, um, sorry, whether the worksheet that this class module currently is tied to um, was protected. And if it is, then it's going to reprotect the worksheet. So let's run to this sheet protection demo shortly. <clears throat> and I use a different type of declaration that you have seen so far because I've used dim sheet instance as new CLS sheet. Um, I did this on purpose in this situation because this allows me to directly call sheet instance e dot worksheet equals and then the worksheet's name. Because as soon as I try to call um, sheet instance, it's going to automatically create an instance of the CLS sheet class for me. So I don't have to write code like um, set C um, sheet instance equals new. Oh God, my, my fingers are thick. So by putting the new statement in the declaration, this statement here becomes obsolete. So I'm going to get rid of it. Uh, by the way, there are situations where this is actually advised against, but I'm not going to go into that here now. So next step is I'm going as to assign the worksheet called protection demo of the active workbook to my worksheet object inside the class. And finally, I'm going to unprotect the worksheet. So I'm first going to check whether the worksheet is protected, and if it is, it's going to set my is protected variable to true. It's going to unprotect the worksheet and remember the password. So and now I can change the value of cell D3 successfully, as you can see here. And to prove that, you can see this is my current date and time, 16th November, 7 a 7 p.m. But now comes the good part of this. Notice how I didn't write any code in my subroutine to reprotect my sheet. I'm just going to end sub. So I'll press F8 here, and it's going to jump into my class terminate event, detect whether my worksheet was protected. It was, it's going to protect the sheet here, set the worksheet to nothing, and we're done. And I can now no longer double click this cell to edit it. So this is one class to handle one sheet. Um, I also have a class module that can handle the entire workbook. And it is slightly more convoluted, but not that much. Um, for example, um, I made it easy to myself. It only has a public property WB to set the workbook to. Um, so there's no property set and let statements here. Um, but regardless, as soon as you um, call the unprotect method, it's going to first unprotect the workbook if it's protected. And after that, it's going to also unprotect all of the worksheets that are protected using, uh, by the way, the same password for all of them. And then once everything's done, it's going to protect the workbook and I see I forgot to add the code to 
protect all of the sheets, but maybe I didn't. Let's have a look. So back to the class of classes here. See how there is no code here that reprotects anything? It's just this. That's all. So let's run through this. So because I have that new keyword here, I don't need to instantiate an instance of the workbook instance because it's doing that behind the scenes for me, which is lazy programming, but okay, nevertheless. So I've set it the workbook and now I'm telling it to unprotect everything using one password. So it's jumping into my method called unprotect and it's getting a new collection of all the sheet instances because I'm going to instantiate a new instance of every, for every worksheet, I'm going to instantiate a new instance of the CLS sheet class that I just showed to you. So it's going to run through all the worksheets. Um, let me just run through this quickly. Run to, run to cursor. We're here now. I'll show you the locals window. We have sheet instance here. And at the top, we have the me keyword, and here we have all of the sheet instances. And as you can see, my workbook has eight worksheets, and if I remember correctly, number seven, no, number eight is the one that's protected, as you can see here, is protected, password is demo. So for every workbook, sorry, for every worksheet, I have an instance, and as you can see, all of them, are mostly unprotected except for the last one. Good, so we're here, I'm going to F8 this. And so now I've done all my processing and I want my workbook to be reprotected. And all it takes is just running into the end subroutine because if I F8 here, it's going to run through all the class terminate events automatically. So it's first going to encounter the class terminate event of my CLS workbook class. And because I'm setting the sheet instances collection to nothing, it's also going to run through all the sheet, um, the class terminate events that belong to the CLS sheet classes here, instances. So if I F8 here, hopefully VBA editor is going to cooperate now. Ha, huh, lucky. I'm going to put a breakpoint here and I'm going to F5, but believe me, it's going to run through this seven times. See, the first one isn't protected. The second one also isn't protected and etc. So I'm going to F5. The last one is protected, so it's going to re-protect it now. And then destroying the pointer to it. And finally, it's going to protect the workbook class itself because that was, well, if it were protected. So there you go. I have two, two, two class modules, CLS workbook and CLS sheet. And combined, these allow me to very easily um, unprotect a workbook and all of its worksheets with just one single statement. Well, to be pedantic, actually there are three. Um, but I don't need to do any housekeeping further down the tree because it's going to take care of the termination for me automatically. Uh, Ken, I think that was most of what I wanted to speak to about today. Um, it wasn't necessarily that well structured, um, in my opinion, but I hope you got something out of it. I definitely got something out of it, so I, I appreciate it. And I hope I hope everybody else did as well. I mean, I, I think that was fairly well structured. You walk through the process of what happens in these things, and I mean, certainly from you know, it's funny, we talked about this before we actually got on uh, on the show here is just that, you know, for, for some of us who've actually um, are already deep in the weeds of this that have taught ourselves, we missed some of the, the basic piece along the way. For me today, that was the, I didn't know you could assign things directly to a variable without having the let and get statement. So I think there's value in all this stuff, Andrew, it's fantastic. Um, I did see a comment in the chat from, uh, from Donald about uh, the fact that he hasn't written a class module in 20 years. I'm like, okay, how's that possible? But, you know, the reality is, is it sounds like he's actually doing more work now in Power Query and Power BI because that's where tools are going for data manipulation, which is what Donald used to be doing. For myself personally, if I'm building an application though, I mean, VBA is where it's at, right? So it comes down to yeah. the right tool for the right job. So yeah, no, really good stuff. 
Um, and yeah, yeah I mean, it's about about that comment, I mean, I find myself getting less um, less customers too. Mm-hmm. Uh, less customers who are interested in doing heavy lifting and VBA and stuff like that because, well, yeah, I mean, it it just proves that VBA was being used a lot for data manipul- manipulation processes. Absolutely, yeah. And and Power Query is simply taking over that. Yep, for sure. And I although, think it's a good thing. Although, you know, Power Query still is programming. It's just that people don't realize they're programming. Well, the thing is, though, is that, yeah, I mean, you also have to remember that, you know, a development of a Power Query script is a lot easier, a lot faster in order to develop that script. But the performance of the actual execution when you're refreshing data is generally slower than what you can get from VBA. So it comes down to if speed is really important, while well, the development time may be longer, but the actual execution time can run in seconds where Power Query might be a minute, you know, to, to do the same job. But again, I mean, you know, it comes down to where do you want your investment uh, on these things? And then, of course, there's, well, I mean, right now, Power Query only runs on desktop in Excel. Anyway, it doesn't run on web yet, but I think that's going to be changing where VBA is going to be desktop bound for its entire existence, right? So, but yeah. Yeah, well, uh, there's, there's that, yeah, and Power Query also, you know, because it in it's not just Power Query in Excel, of course, it also runs in Power BI. So it, it is a yeah. good, you know, it's a good tool to do some, um, uh, how do you call that, prototyping, and then yep. easier to port to a more, you know, um, big world ready application. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, but you know what, that's, that's the beauty. We got multiple tools to do the same job. Now you get to pick the right one. Right. And that's the, isn't that part where everybody wins? So, um, yeah, well, I, I I did a a comparison between Power Query and, and, and and VBA probably over five years ago. And, and, and I can, I can affirm what you said, because I think that the, the VBA code run like, Ran like took like ten times less time than the, than the Power Query code. Yep. Um, but you know the amount of time to develop that VBA code. Oh, and the maintenance of it. Whew. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Definitely harder. So, yeah. Absolutely. No question. But again, right? I mean, it just comes down. It's the right tool for the right job, and sometimes it's about what's required at the end. Hey, I see John has his hand raised. John, come on, talk to us. What's what's up? Yeah. So I built a, a class module this morning. I don't do many of them. But, you know, I do my um, presentations in Excel and I'm preparing a video for a client right now and I need to fit it within a certain time period because otherwise I'll go on and on for days. But anyway, I wanted to know how long I spend on each uh, sheet because each sheet is like an example or a subtopic. And, you know, sitting here and looking at my clock and saying, OK, it's a. Uh, 110 and 16 seconds and writing that down and doing all the math with pencil and paper forget it so i wrote a class module this morning and it used uh, it w- it used a with events application class and every time i changed the um the worksheet it you know it saved it saved the name of the active sheet and the time that i started on the sheet and when i changed it to the next one it output the the name of the sheet and how many minutes and seconds I was on it and then it saved the name of the new sheet I'm on and then uh, when I went to the next new sheet then I so I ended up with a list of sheets and how much how much time I spend on each one and it it's uh, really pretty elegant so cool nice. um, yeah if I say so myself I don't make <laughs> a lot of I I don't I don't write a lot of class modules but um, if you think about it a user form is a fancy class module because it's a class module that also has a a designer where you can you can build a dialogue with all this other stuff so i do a lot of work uh with class module st- type stuff there and i'm always passing stuff with properties and the nice thing about a property is if somebody enters data you can validate the data before you put it in you can um because it's a on a dialogue you know based on what they do in one place, you can change things on the dialogue. You can put a label there, you can um, put a message, you can uh, hide some controls which are no longer relevant and, and show other ones. And uh, it, it just gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, and, and that's just by passing uh, data into the class. And, um, it, you know, it's, and, you know, I'm sure I'm, I'm 
still writing bad code, but it's it's better because I follow some of the some of the techniques that Giancarlo was showing today. Yeah, I'm not that good in following my own techniques, actually. But you know, I, I, I tried. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> rules were made to be broken. I think I think yeah. somewhere there's an image of some with something where somebody's built code and it just looks like this massive village of stick houses are all like you know put together and whatever yeah. and, and it says mm-hmm. I'm gonna redesign this to make this like perfect and then they they rebuild the whole thing and it looks just the same right and it's like yeah that's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's not the way that code goes but now I mean I'll, I'll say I mean for myself I mean class modules I mean we, you know we we use those in uh, in monkey tools we actually built our own custom object model because at the end of the day um, power queries and power pivot tables don't actually have a connection to to each other inside the VBA model, even though you load Power Query to the data model. So with a lot of work and parsing behind the scenes, um, I was able to actually sort of work out what those connections are. And I actually have object models, which originally started in VBA, I've since ported to VB.net, but um, but that allow me to to load an object, my own object model, so that when I'm then coding, I can basically say like, you know, go get me the the power pivot table and tell me what the name of the qu- the connection is by just using those properties. And I mean, I think it if you're building applications, mm-hmm. uh, it is I, I can't imagine building an app without using classes. I mean, it, it's it was crazy. It's interesting to see some of your examples for unprotecting things. I never would have thought of doing that. So that's just kind of a neat little smaller scale but and yet still super useful right which is pretty neat so i think they got incredible incredible power once you start to actually uh, you know throw yourself into them for sure yeah i i've used, I've used something similar to do um performance timing of of um subroutines yeah so i have a, a timer class which i instantiate at the start of every routine and then because the class gets destroyed automatically at the end of the routine um, that's the moment where you can actually write the time to a log or something. Um, there you go. It also allows you to com- to com- build a complete call stack because, well, if you, you know if you plan the uh, the way that it writes the information to the log uh, meticulously, then it's going to give you the entire call stack automatically. Cool. Oh, very Stuff nice. Like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's big I'll time stop programming for now. <laughs> right, fair enough. Yeah. Um, awesome. Uh, so I see the uh, comment in the, in the chat that says they're looking forward to the recording. Uh, I will get this recording up. Uh, my intent is to have it out in the next uh, in the next couple of days. Um, as soon as I do, uh, I will post on the Meetup site. So everybody that uh, RSVP'd to the Meetup site will get a notification that it is live. Um, outside of that, uh, Jan Carl, thanks so much for coming and doing this. this is a great presentation. Really enjoyed it. Um, hopefully we'll get you back in the uh, in the new year for uh, for something uh, slightly different, but uh, but that'll be great. And yeah. uh, I want to thank everyone for coming as well. It's been a, a fantastic presentation. Yeah, so, thanks, Jan Carl. Thanks, uh, Ken. It was my pleasure awesome. entirely. Awesome. All right. Well, I think for today I'm going to uh, I'm going to shut this one down for now. Time to time to go to work on my side. Time to go and uh, relax with a glass of wine. I think for Jan Carl or a beer. Um, cause man, what is it? What time is it for you right now? It must be. It's not too bad. It's, it's, uh, 15 past 7 PM. Oh, that's not bad, but still it's evening time. You should relax. Job well I done. Will. So thanks bud. Appreciate it. Looking forward to seeing you guys next time. Yeah. Thanks right. for having me. All right. You bet. Bye. Bye now.